and, and let you know a little bit about what they do. And it's real important. It ties into what we're going to be talking about today, uh, mainly because, you know, if you look at a control room, security operations center, network operations center, et cetera, you know, it, it's really, um, you know, four walls in approach with um, the room design, lighting, video walls, the, the command consoles or dispatch consoles that are in these rooms. And so, you know, they approach it much like we do, and that is we try to consider a lot of different variables in, in the way that we recommend products or solutions to customers or guide a customer in their, their process of trying to learn about, you know, what's the right thing for them to do. So, Jennifer, why don't you take just a minute and um, uh, inter introduce yourself. Thank you, Robert, um, and thanks for a great description um, on SBFI. But as Robert said, I am Jennifer Taylor, and we also have on the call uh, my teammate Brandon Scroggs. And as Robert said, um, SBFI has been around for over 44 years, and we have two divisions. We have a financial division, and then we have a mission-critical furniture division. And myself and Brandon both work for the mission-critical division and we um, work with Diversified and other um, companies uh, in the command and control room to make sure that we're giving the customers exactly what they want. And uh, Robert um, is an integral part of that process when it comes to the furniture. So I think he's gonna tell you a little bit more on his side, uh, but if anybody has any specific uh, furniture questions, they can reach out to both uh, Brandon or myself. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, you, you bet. And uh, at the end here, I will, uh, you know, display some contact information for those that might need it um, that allow you to, to reach out to either Jennifer or the SBI team and, um, and then uh, for us at Diversified. But a little bit about us real quick before we dive right into this thing is, you know, if you're not familiar with Diversified, we are an integrator of visualization technologies, collaborate, collaborative technologies, and we work in spaces uh, we, we're, we're split up into a variety of different types of specialty groups from audiovisual for traditional conference rooms, boardrooms, training rooms, and all the collaborative technologies that, uh, that you would use in those type of environments to mission critical, which is why we're here today, broadcast, um, medical industry, uh, and the list just goes on. We, we have a security practice where we, we work with physical security and IT services. So, we're, you know, as our name describes us that's that's how we go to, to market is we're a very diversified company in the uh, offerings that we have but they are very technology based and they're very integration based so we pro provide full turnkey solutions to our customers um, in in all of these different um, specialties that we have so that being said um, you know what's interesting to me um, as we go uh, into this conversation is you know, we're here to talk about visualization technology, but I think I'd be remiss if I didn't start the conversation out with a little bit of historical background and then use that to launch us into um, a couple of different things that I think are, are the backstory. And, then, and I'll, I'll go back to that in a minute, but there's, there's some science behind the selection of video wall technology or any type of visual visualization platform. That, that warrants a discussion um, because it's, there are so many things that are left out of this decision-making process that people get into, in trouble when they're trying to select these type of technologies for their applications. And so, you know, from a historical perspective, I've been in the business now for, well, I've been in the business for about 29 years, but I've, I've been in the mission critical side of the business for about 17 or 18 years, and I've had the good fortune to work most of that time with uh, Diversified, which has been a, a, a couple of different companies over the many years that I've been here. But, uh, but we go into the brand name Diversified today, a very good team of uh, highly trained you know, specialists. But um, what's interesting is that in the mission critical world, the technology has gone from being very expensive, very complex, very large, very hard to work with back you know, 17, 18 years ago to being something very different today. And, uh, you know, it used to be that um, it, it, it was like, you know, it, it was a major, major project to, um, to outfit a control room with uh, video walls and, and displays. And so 
you know, now that that's all changing, it's changing the dynamics about how decisions are made about what is the right technology or what type of consoles. Because it's not just about the video wall or visualization technology. It's about console furniture. It's about the software. It's about how you lay the rooms out and design the rooms. It's about all of this stuff. Again, working four walls in. Uh, but there's a backstory. I mentioned about a backstory. The backstory is, I think um, there are a lot of parts to it, but the two I want to talk about today is, you know, it's the not so obvious things that um, come into play when you need to make a decision about selecting the right type of technology. And one of, one of those things um, is uh, what, what we would call room design and layout. And the other is workflow processes. And it all comes together here in a minute. Um, but what I'd like to talk about with, as it relates to the backstory and room design is it's real important um, to, when you're talking about the selection of any type of visual display platform, we call them, is um, to, you know, what, why is it relevant? And, and, and it's really uh, about if you don't understand the type of environment that you're going to put this technology in and how are you going to use it, then you could end up with the wrong type of solution that that doesn't provide the quality that you want or might be too small in size or too large or too expensive and you didn't need to spend as much money. So we always try to, when we're working with customers, kind of step back a few steps like you're building a house and let's make sure the foundation of <clears throat> the house is put in correctly so the framing goes upright. And once the framing goes upright, then you can start adding all the you know, closing in of the house and then finishing off the house inside. And we take that very similar process in, in the way we work with our customers and, and recommend uh, products is by asking a lot of questions of, of their facility. And, you know, so when it comes to room design and, and the layout of your room, it doesn't matter if it's a security op center, if it's a network op center, or if you're a power utility and you have a control room or dispatch. It could be a 911 center with a dispatch uh, team there. It really doesn't matter. These dynamics are, are at play in all of these rooms and environments. And uh, some of the things that I would say that uh, I would suggest you to look look out for would be, you know, what are your ceiling heights in these rooms? And, and where are the windows in the rooms? And which wall would you locate this on so you have the best view and the less disruption of of people coming in and out of the room? Who needs to see it? You know, where are the life safety devices in the ceiling? Are there some mounted on the wall? You know, what are the lighting conditions in the room? So there are a lot of different things you want to be thinking about when it comes to, you know, the room design. And I can't really cover all of them today in, in a little 30-minute session with you. And, and we'll have more of these in the future. But, you know, just for today, let, let, me, let me kind of pick on a, about three of these that, that will help you if you happen to be in the market for visualization technology or if you just, you know, think that you may be in the future or you're just here to learn. So the three that I, I'd like to, to talk about really is, you know, your what, what I call sight lines. The other is the mounting options. And then, you know, w w the wall locations. So sight lines are real important because a lot of times we're given rooms to work within, right? We don't have the luxury that we're building a brand new building or expanding our facility so we have new construction and we can kind of do a lot more of what we want. We're, we have a room that we've either been working in and we're just going to update the technology or do some minor renovations or somebody says, here's a room you can use and, you know, you, you have a support structure beam right in the middle of the floor. So, we have to work within those dynamics a lot of time. But what's, what's real important is the sight lines of how you're going to lay your, your furniture and console out and who needs to see this video wall or the displays that are going to be on the screen. And to what extent, and I'll cover this in a few minutes, to what extent do those people have to actually read the content on there and understand it? Uh, and do they have to actually use the video wall for their job. And, and again, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that when it comes to workflow processes and, and content. That'll be here in just a minute. But the sight lines are extremely important because you want to make sure that everybody that needs to see the content can see the content. You want to make sure that uh, what we call the sill height of the bottom of those displays are at least 48 to 50 inches off the finished floor. 
the high, higher is better, but not too high because if you have a row of consoles and people sitting close to the screen, you don't want them having to look look up too much, right? But but there's a balance there, and, and an integrator like us can help you with that. Um, you know, and or manufacturers that sell this technology, we can help you understand what are the dynamics of what I have to do to be able to make sure that wall is in that video wall is installed correctly. And so the sill height again is the bottom of the screens. And here's what's the, where people get into to trouble. A, a lot of rooms, it's an existing room. We're working with about a nine foot ceiling. Sometimes you get a 10 foot ceiling or a little higher. And the, the problem I see a lot of customers getting in, into is, you know, they, they have consoles with their desktop monitors and they haven't considered that, you know, they want that uh, the biggest video wall they can put up there, but they don't realize that the bottom of the screens are going to be 36 or 42 inches off the finished floor. And the people in those uh, sitting at those consoles aren't going to be able to see the bottom of the screen because they're going to be cut off by their desktop monitors. And so when you're, you're, that's where the sight line comes in. If you're, if you have the ability to take those measurements and work with a provider that can provide that to you, then, you know, I would suggest do that and, and, and make sure that you can get a, a layout of your room. You can, you know, do a side elevation and, and make sure that when somebody's sitting in that, that chair, looking over their monitors, that they're going to see the bottom. And, and so that drives what size video wall that you can put on that wall because the ceiling height, let's say it's fixed at nine feet, but you don't have a lot of real estate to work with there, although you can, and we do all day long, put in two by three, two by four, two by six style video walls and nine foot ceilings. But just be aware of where your monitors sit at their highest position on the consoles in relationship to where the bottom of that screen is going to be. So that, that's sight lines. So the other important thing about room design and how it all ties into what type of product that you'll end up with is the mounting options. And there are a variety of different ways to, to mount visual display technology. And, and mainly we're talking today about video walls because you know, while projectors in the ceiling with motorized screens can be used, and I've seen them in mainly emergency operation centers that aren't 24-7, 365, they come alive for a few days or a few weeks, and then they go back to sleep because they're not needed. Those are environments you might be able to get away with a, a really high-end ceiling-mounted projector and some screens. But in most of the control rooms, and mission critical environments we work within, the LCD flat panel um, video walls are what, you know, what, what seems to work the best. Um, so when I say that, the reason I'm saying that is that the mounting options you have, you need to be real careful with that because you can mount these to the wall and some walls already have built-in support that can distribute the weight of these panels because the video wall is made up of multiple panels. So you have to be cognizant of the fact of, do you have the support already built into the wall behind your sheetrock? And if you don't, you have to make accommodations to put some backing material up there so that you can distribute that weight. And if you have a facilities person in your company, they would be able to probably help you with that to understand what you have to work with. The other option, if you're not going to actually mount it on the wall, that kind of makes it a moot point about that and the weight distribution is to incorporate when you purchase a video wall structure is the actual enclosure structure, which is called um, a, it's actually called a video wall structure that has cladding or decorative panels around it um, to hide the actual metal structure. And so that's actually resting on the floor and anchored to the wall, so it's not actually supported by the wall itself. It's the the, the load bearing weight of that is is on the floor a, as a structure, and then it's finished off, like I said, around it to aesthetically make it look good. And and so those because today we're talking about LCD technology. Your distance from the back wall to the front of the screen is typically five or six inches. 
sometimes maybe as, as far as seven inches, but you know, compared to what it was 10 years ago when it was two feet or three feet away from the wall, you know, the real estate that you need to put a, a video wall or a visual display platform up today is, is dramatically reduced. Um, so the, that, that's the mounting piece of this. And then the, the other piece that I find that customers have a tendency to, to you know, not really understand, and, and it's not anything other than I deal with this all day long, as do a lot of people, and then a lot of people don't. But, uh, but if you have a wall where the entrance um, is on the opposite end of the room, so when somebody needs to come in and out of the room, the door to that room is in the back on the far, farthest wall away from the video wall structure, that's ideal because then it, it limits the disruption of people coming in and out of the room and people seeing them walk in and out of the room, especially if there's a, a critical event you're trying to manage and everybody's focused on the content on that video wall. If, if people can enter and leave the room in the back of the room, it's always, always better. So those would be a few examples of, you know, again, the room design, the layout, and how do you incorporate a video wall? A few things, again, I could talk about this one thing alone for probably 45 minutes because there is a lot of science behind this and there's a lot of human factor issues and ergonomic issues that we could get into. And we have actually talked about that in a couple of the other sessions that we had in the summer. And we'll, we'll do these again, as I mentioned. But, but anyway, so from a room design perspective, that, that's some guidance that I would provide you with, with that. And uh, so the other part of the backstory, if you will, is, is workflow processes. And this is, again, something that a lot of people in our industry um, that sell this type of technology, that manufacture this type of technology, they don't talk about as much as they should. And um, I think it's very important, and, and you'll see why here in a second. This workflow process really is all about you know, the relevance of the content that you use at the desktops and or are going to display on that video wall that helps you to determine the, the distance that your operators or dispatchers in their, at their consoles in their seats need to be in relationship to where that wall is that the video wall or your visualization platform is mounted on and that the type of content is it very granular content maps and SCADA type software that there's a lot of detail in, or is it, you know, really more video and, and things that are less you know, or more forgiving than the less forgiving of the SCADA systems and maps and things like that. So workflow also has to do with your staff and how they work. And, and again, th this is where the science comes in, and I'm, I'm no subject matter expert at this one specific thing, but I've learned over the years really how important it is, and so I've, I've, I've read up on it and, and, and I've, I've you know, tried to educate myself the best that I can, but you know, there are a couple of different styles, there's probably more than that, of the way people work in control rooms. And the way that people work in control rooms, there's either what is called an integrator or a pioneer. And the pioneer might sound pretty obvious what, what the definition of that is. That's the, the worker that either has the natural tendency to be um, an independent thinker, kind of makes his own decision, decisions are made in a silo, or it could be the way that their job description requires them to act in that role versus the integrator that's more of a team player, a people person. They collaborate with other team members to make decisions and to get things done. And, and how that all plays into the video wall would certainly be with who needs to see that information and, and are they working from the video wall or using it as, as support. And I do have customers that, that have a few of their staff using the video wall as a primary display for their work and using their desktops uh, in conjunction with that. So one doesn't necessarily act as the primary and the secondary. They, they use both the desktop monitors and the video wall as, as the way they do their jobs um, most of the time. And then I have other customers, which is the larger group of customers that really don't use the video wall 
for you know the primary function of, of jobs of their staff. It's really a supporting mechanism. It's what's called the common operating picture, right? It's where you can aggregate a lot of different types of disparate content that you know multiple different groups of people or individuals that are working on different problems or different parts of a solution for your your organization and operations where they can look and kind of get centered back to you know um, where they need to be or if there's a mission critical event that's going on everybody can understand what's going on right now so that's the broader sense of what when my customers use it for is that common operating picture it doesn't make one right and one wrong it just you have to ask the question like I said this is the backstory ask yourself the question about how do my people work and who's going to use it and how are they going to use it what is the content that I'm going to put on it and is the content that I'm going to put on the video wall? And this is going to be important in a minute when I talk about technology because there are a couple of different types of technology that are really ideally suited for the mission critical environment but but content has has a big part of that conversation but you got to ask these questions to to lead up to again building that foundation so that the framing goes up better and the rest of the house comes together nicely um they're, they're you know in in my opinion i think that um that that that's a big piece of what a lot of people don't do is is ask a lot of questions they they look at solely the technology and the brightness and the price and you know finding a good integrator and let's just go install that on the wall got a blank wall right here I don't know, maybe that works for some people, but I, I tell you, my experience has been it doesn't work as well as if you can do a lot of thinking up front and ask a lot of questions. And I would say the bigger your project, meaning the, the more people you have in your center, the bigger wall space that you need to occupy with some type of common operating picture or visualization solution, the, the more you've got to pay attention to that backstory and the science behind this stuff because it'll serve you very well, let me tell you. Um, very well. If you're really interested in trying to understand how your people work and and maybe you think that you could do a better job and be more proficient at at workflow processes, there there I'm not going to talk about it today, but I, I, you can go look this up in in Google and it's called DISC D I S C, and DISC is it's a theory, it's a methodology of uncovering. The, the four different styles of or work styles that your people could have and what one would be dominance and the other is influence the other is steadiness and the other is conscientiousness and these four different styles of workers um, can profoundly impact the way that you your people are efficient or productive in your organization and again I don't want to I, I could get into this again in a long conversation I don't want to do that today uh, but, you know, if you're really interested and you want to take the decision of purchasing a video wall or a visual display platform seriously, go, go look up DISC, D-I-S-C, and do a little bit of a deep dive into that and understand some of the dynamics behind this because it could be a game changer for, for some organizations. Some organizations may have already kind of looked into this or have a great way they do business and, and that's cool and not here to change that, right? But but if you feel like that you're looking for a, a better way of sort of looking at how my people are, are more efficient and productive, and, and then by understanding that, that helps you to make a better decision with either redesigning your control room or, or adding more consoles, adding video displays, then it, you're just, you know, you're ahead of the game with that. So, so I want to kind of stop talking about the backstory now because because we're we're about 20 minutes into this thing and I really want to be respectful of your time but but I want to get into the meat of why we're here on the call today and that's really more about the technology that's out there and and things like that. So, you know, like I said, I've been in the business a long time. I've seen a lot of different types of technology come and go and fade out as new technology is introduced. I've seen prices go from really expensive to very, very inexpensive because of the new technology, you know, and all different things. Uh, but I tell you, we're in a really unique uh, environment these days with uh, with mission critical operation centers. Uh, there, there's there the technology that's available today is is just really neat stuff, and it's not neat because it's cool and it looks cool. 
it is that. It's really neat, I think, because it's very efficient. It's very cost effective. It's easier to understand today than it than it used to be. Um, the the cost of ownership to own this type of technology today is so much less than it used to be 10 or 15 years ago, um, and, and it used to be a, a pretty pricey to maintain this stuff over a seven or 10 year period of time. Some of you on the call may have had that experience. Some of you may be new to it. Um, and you have a lot more selection of providers out there in the industry that are doing this, and, and I guess that's just a natural progression of any type of technology, be it PC, software, cell phones, or whatever, is that as the market expands and grows, um, more providers get involved in it. And, and our markets have expanded. When, when I got into this years ago, I mean, it was really kind of your command and control for military, a handful of public safety, some utility control rooms and you know things of that nature, some telecoms. And today it has grown into security operations for enterprise, for universities. Hospitals are using security operation centers. Hospitals are actually building today rooms called customer care command centers where they aggregate all of the operations of their hospital from food services to staffing to medicine distribution to scheduling of surgery to you know, maintaining their facilities. It's just all controlled out of one big command center now with with big massive video wall or depends on the size of the hospital, might not be a big massive video wall. Um, but, but social media listening centers are utilizing the technology that we have. So, you know, a, a lot of changes have happened. And so, you know, when I look at mission critical environments and I go, you know, yeah, we could put a ceiling mount projector in here or, or just some flat panel displays that you can get from any, any type of manufacturer out there. I don't want to, you know, call out names, but the, you know, there, there are dozens of them out there that sell just individual LCD monitors that you can put on the wall and hook computers up to. And in some cases that's the right thing to do. And, uh, and it works really well. But in, in most environments today, our customers want to utilize, you know, what's called a virtual desktop or a, a video wall of some type. And there are two technologies out there that I would say are the dominant technologies that you need to be considering. And one is called flat panel LCD or narrow bezel LCD. And the other is LED, direct view LED. And I'm going to cover a little bit of, of both of these. Um, here, I, I'm going to skip a slide. Uh, we've already talked about that, but whoops, went too far. This one right here, I want to. Sorry. So, this one right here is where I want to focus for a few minutes. Is in the mission critical environment, if you're looking to establish a common operating picture for either the teams to work off of or individuals to actually do their job on. The narrow bezel LCD has been around for several years now, and it has matured to the point where the bezel thickness around the glass, it's, it's really kind of the plastic that holds that glass together, has gone from being an inch or two wide down to being about maybe twice as thick, three times as thick at the most as of a credit card. It's extremely thin, and that's where they call it narrow bezel or even seamless LCD. Um, there, there are some manufacturers out there that um, are labeling their zero bezel LCDs, and there's truth to that where the, 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 the material they use around the edge of the glass is so thin that literally, unless you're standing a few feet away from it, it's very hard to see that they're there is a bezel around it, which is the grid you see on a lot of video walls. But LCD technology is, is by far the most utilized technology for, for any type of visual display platform in mission critical environments. It's cost effective. Uh, there are a number of features I'll go through in a minute that make it a really solid solution and, and reliable. Um, and But what's happening in the industry is direct view LED, which was introduced really several years ago, uh, more than that actually, probably 10 or 12 years ago in the entertainment market where you'd go to a, a sports stadium or concert 
and they'd have the big video projection screens behind, you know, the band or or up around the stadium. And those those were direct view LEDs, but direct view LEDs, you know, for the outdoor market are very, very different in than what is needed for inside of a room. And what I'm gonna do is kind of talk a little bit about about the difference here and and why maybe one would be better over another. So, you know, with the LCD, um, some of the things that are important, you know, there are going to be pros and cons to both of these things, but some of the things that are important that you need to look at if you're going to look at these two technologies for, for an application would be, well, first of all, you have to know there are only two sizes today of LCDs, and most of the products that are developed are 55 inch diagonal screen sizes. They do make 46, but I can't remember the last time I designed a system around a 46 inch LCD video for a video wall. Everybody uses almost as a de facto standard, the 55s. Um, it creates less seams on, on the video wall. And at the end of the day, it ends up being, you know, just a, an all around better solution, um, less, less screens for you to manage, uh, et cetera. But, uh, but some of the things that you've got to look at is making sure that the display manufacturer warrants your product for 24-7, and they all kind of do that now. But how many years will they do that for? Some provide a one- or two-year warranty, and they say, well, the first year we'll you know, provide you with a 7 by 24 warranty. After that, it's, it's not 7 by 24 and some say it's two years. And so be, just look into the warranty and make sure you know what you have there. A lot of companies are doing three years, seven by 24 or 24 by seven coverage, and, and then you can extend it out to five. So the warranty on an LCD solution is, is real important. You, you, want, you want to keep that. The life on an, on an LCD is really interesting too because it depends on how you have the brightness and the calibration set for that. The, the, if you take the brightness down a few notches, um, and you have the ability to do that because you don't have a lot of ambient light in your room, then you'll get a lot longer life out of that because it produces less heat. And heat is really the killer for LCDs in many ways. Heat from not only the technology that creates the display image, but also with the power supplies and things like that. But, but if you are able to, um, I hate the lack of better word, if you're able to let's just say reduce the brightness, <laughs> That'd probably be a better way to describe it, Bob. But if you can d reduce that brightness, so you'll get a longer life out of it. Typically, we're seeing, you know, anywhere from three to five years of useful life out of an LCD, and and that's pretty good. Yeah, actually, that's pretty good. But if you look at the cost of it, you know, so the cost of a one panel, like you see right there in the left side of that on the left side of that screen, the narrow bezel LCD, you know, the, the prices can range depending on you know, what resolution you get, um, is it truly zero bezel or is it a narrow bezel? What, what, is, what is that measurement? You know, a few different factors built in there, but they can range in price from about four grand a piece uh, up to about $8,000 a piece. And, and then some of them include all the hardware to mount them with and some of them don't. So you kind of got to do a little bit of homework and, and make sure you understand wh what you're getting um, and what you need. Uh, but anyway, so the LCD, um, again, you know, 55 inch is really the standard 24 seven warranty. Make sure that you, you, you look into that and the bezel width to understand because the, the smaller the bezel width, the, the more expensive it's going to be, right? Because that's the smaller the bezel width means it's a, a more contemporary technology. It's a newer release of that technology. There are some things that manufacturers are doing today to differentiate their pro products and and one of them is an anti-glare screen on there. And, and anti-glare comes in actually an overlay that is very thin that you really wouldn't know it's an overlay or it's a coating that can be put on the screens. And, and the anti-glare, it, and it depends on which manufacturer that you are looking at, but the anti-glare that they put on there can range in terms of the amount of glare that it reduces anywhere from 50 to 75 percent. And so kind of look into that when you're looking at specifications. And uh, 
and that'll be real important, especially in high ambient light environments. Is is you know looking at specifications or talking to to, to your integration partner or a manufacturer about what what they have for anti glare, and uh, the other the other one is is color calibration. This is really important. You know, so when you aggregate, let's just say you have a video wall that's too tall by two of these panels tall by three wide. So that's called a two by three. It's six panels all put together to create one big screen, right? You've got very, very thin bezels between them. Some cases may not even see the bezel really at a distance. Well, the question is, how do you keep the uniformity of brightness and the colors such that it doesn't look like one screen's darker, lighter than the other, the red's more red here than it is in the left corner? You know, how do you do that? And most of the companies today are have it or are about to have it, and that is an automation software that comes with each of these panels that automatically, when these are put together and configured as a video wallet, automatically calibrates on a routine basis all of the brightness levels and the color levels, the contrast levels between all of the panels, and and it sums it up and adju automatically adjusts everything to keep keep them within a certain specification of of, of uh, brightness and, and color saturation and, and contrast so that you don't get that kind of checkerboard effect. That, that's that been huge in the industry. We used to have that on the big video cubes that we installed years ago that were, you know, two or three feet deep and, you know, really expensive and hard. They, they had that type of software on those products but but only in the last couple of years has it started to really be introduced with the uh, with the LCD so so that would be you know what what would be automated uh, calibration color and brightness um, calibration and uh, and so you know that's just a few of the characteristics that you need to be thinking about and looking at on LCD uh, you know what are some of the pros and cons about LCD well I think there are a lot of pros and fewer cons but that's just me, right? And everybody makes their own decision. But I think because of the price point and the low cost of long-term ownership, uh, the the excellent image quality you're, you're going to get, um, the ease of service, and uh, the wide range of content that you can display on LCD and and get a good quality image. It, it's a very reliable solution for for the control room or the mission critical environment. Um, some of the cons I would say is that they're on most of these, unless you're going to buy a, a, a newer version, you are going to get a little bit of a seam. Some people that bothers and some people it doesn't. So, you know, it kind of it's a little bit of a personal thing in many ways. Is Can you tolerate a little bit of a thin line separating each of these panels? And most people can. It's, it's not, you know, something that is uh, um, a, a, a real bad problem, but, you know, like I said, some people just don't want to seem, and, and that's cool. Um, I, I think that ultimately, and we're going to jump into LED here in a minute, and I'll, I'll support why I'm telling you what I'm going to tell you um, when we talk about LED, but I think that LCD, unless there are some things that are being worked on with LCD types of technology that I'm not aware of, I think the lifespan of LCD it has about another five years of manufacturers manufacturing these products and maybe another five after that of them supporting the technology with spare parts and things because I think everything will eventually start moving more towards the LED solution. So let's hop over. And by the way, we're going to have a Q&A at the end if there are questions that you have. So, you know, we'll take a few minutes there. Um, and I need to just look at the time. We're running way over. I seem to be talking a lot, but I hope you guys don't mind. I'll try to you know, kind of wrap this up here over the next 15 minutes. But, uh, but, but direct view LED is a newer technology that's out. It's really a nice technology, but it, it was introduced to be an outdoor product for its brightness capabilities. If you could see at the bottom of the screen the little dot patterns, I did that, and I did the best that I could to show you the, the different – types of, of pixels that are used for LCD versus LED. LED refers to when you're talking about their pixels, it's pixel pitch. 
and and it's the the distance between these pixels me measured in millimeters and so if you see that those three dotted square boxes you see a wider disbursement a little tighter and then a fairly tight one there on the lower right hand side versus over on the left hand side a very tight pixel pitch well we're using different technologies we're, we're, we're actually using um, you know um, LED versus the LCD technology and the pixels are very different that's why I put the colored pictures up there so you can kind of see what a very very tight close-in look of what pixels look like because they're very different technologies but but LED is a, a very formidable technology that will in the near future I think start to become more and more widespread in its use as prices go down and as those pixel pitches get tighter that allow you to display content on that LED that you can display on a uh, LCD today. I'm not convinced, and there are some that are, and uh, you know, uh, but I'm not convinced that LED is a viable solution for every control room out there today, unless it's a very big room where the viewing distances are are quite a bit a fairly large distance between the front row of, of consoles and that screen and that, that distance could be 20 or 25 feet distance and a very large screen uh, that would allow you to not see because you would actually be able to see the granularity of the pixels on those screens unless you get the absolute latest um, smallest pixel pitch on there which some are saying is less than 0.9 and and even maybe less than that coming out soon uh, but but I just not convinced that a hundred percent of these rooms especially the smaller mid-size you know five or six or eight person type of security ops center or your your utility control I'm not convinced that that LED is really the right fit for that especially if it's a lot of detailed content from your SCADA maps and, and things like that. If you're a traffic management center showing nothing but full motion video, you might be able to get away with it, you know, with the, the pixel pitches they have today. You, you really might, but you're going to pay for it. It's a lot more expensive technology than LCD. And uh, now, I, I say that, now some of the real benefits of, of LED is that it, it's the lifetime on a, an average LED right now is pushing 100,000 hours. You know, I mean, that that's a lot of hours, right, before you have to replace those things. And it has, I'm not going to say it doesn't have any, but it has very little long-term cost of ownership to, to replace them or update them or replace parts on them. So, you know, if you look at the long-term cost of ownership versus the initial investment and compare the LCD and LED, I mean, you just, you just got to look at what is the content I'm putting on there. How far back are my is my staff from the screens that would make that really a, a quality looking image that they could act, really read the content that's on there? And then how much money do I have to spend now and over the next, say, 10 or 12 years? Those are the type of questions you have to start asking yourself when you're evaluating these technologies out there. Because again, there's a lot of science behind it and there's a lot of math behind it in trying to make the right decision. I have customers that just like LED because they saw it at a trade show and they thought that the images looked fantastic. Well, yeah, they did, but they were showing all sorts of advertising, full motion videos with, you know, race cars, racing. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't content that they might normally look at in their command center. And so what I do is typically have my customers, if you want LED, let's talk about your content. Let's talk about the room that's going to go in and the viewing distances, and then let's take your content on a laptop if possible or a PC to one of the manufacturer showrooms and let's look at your content on these different pixel pitch video walls and then make a determination that yes that's a quality I like or gosh no it's not I don't think I need to be buying that right now so be really careful with these two different solutions and in, in what you're doing um, because there are a lot of factors involved in, in making a decision um, about it. And so, you know, I don't want to cut it short here. I, I've, I've got so much more I could talk about um, with these technologies. I, I want to wrap it up here because, we, like I said, I've gone over what I normally do. 
Um, we're going to have more of these, and I, I certainly hope that you join us. And um, and so I'm going to do a quick recap, and then you know open up some some questions here, and and hopefully answer some questions you may have. But as a recap, what I'd like to say is you know don't focus solely on the technology. You know keep in mind that there are all sorts of things that you have to be looking at and consider that I call the backstory again. It's the room design and layout, how your teams you know work together or independent of each other, and you know what is the content that's on the screen that, that is a really important factor here. Uh, your best options today, I think, in most control room environments are either the LCD or LED. Um, I would lean more towards LCD for a few reasons being cost, and I just don't think that the pixel pitches are there for most people. Um, I think we're getting there, and, and the next year having this conversation, it could be a di totally different conversation because of the way things are changing so much. Um, I think you have to really look at what your initial investment is for either of those technologies, and then what is the long-term cost of ownership for either of these over a 10-year period. And, and the, the math is going to speak for itself, right? Um, I've said this before, but I think you've got to really, you know, if, you, if you've got a, a big, if you if you have a budget um, that's pretty significant, and you know, significant is relative there. <laughs> it's it, it's different for everybody, right? But but if you have a significant amount of money, do some homework and ask a lot of questions because there are a lot to be asked out there. And I tell you, the more educated you are, the, the better off you'll be when it comes time to making that selection. And I, I'd say the last thing is, and you know, we're not the only company that does this type of stuff, and neither is SBFI. I mean, there are dozens of people out there around the world that do this type of work, but. Uh, I would just say find a trusted partner, an integration partner or a manufacturer that you know is going to look out for you. It's going to really look at the science behind things and, and that backstory, if you will, to help you through that selection process because it's not just about the video wall itself. There are all sorts of other things to consider. And with that, why, why don't I do this? Why don't I um, kind of, Lisa, I'm assuming you're still on the call. Um, I'm going to put some contact information up, and what I'd like to do is see if you have any questions that have already come in, and if not, we'll just pause for a second and see if any do come in. Yeah, actually, we do have some questions, Robert. Uh, one is, uh, do they make OLED 24-7 panels? Um, OLED. They, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm yeah. not. I'm not familiar with OLED technology like I am with Direct View LED and LCD. So, I, I have if I have not heard that they are making product in in that technology um, that would make the need. Well, uh, Robert, um, I have a bit more information on that if you don't mind. Yeah. No. Go ahead. Okay. Hey everybody, this is Brandon with SBFI. Um, when it comes to OLED, basically it's developing more of the plastic, flexible tile like style screens, a lot of things that are transparent, um, a bunch of functions that regular LED don't hold. It is a new and developing type of technology, but with those particular uses in it, 24-7 rated, especially at the kind of level that you're going to be looking for, isn't necessarily a good choice. Uh, the vast majority of OLED products on the market right now are being used for digital signage. So you get the clear OLEDs um, as some of the kiosks and malls so people can see through it, um, so people can have them in the windows of their shops and displays. Um, some of the more standard, not clear OLEDs, those are actually used for very bent screens. Um, things that curve up and down, uh, things that curve around an operator, if you've ever seen any of those um, OLED monitors themselves that are about three feet across but have um, a very, very high apex curve, that's really the, the uses for OLED. Um, it doesn't 
tune well to a mission critical center. Um, being able to see through it or having an extreme bend are not really things that uh, I've seen a lot of folks actually looking for. Um, and that technology is so new that it's not 24 seven rated yet and it does have a lot more burnout. Um, so in the future, that is a possibility. You could see completely curved walls within a room itself. But at the moment, if you're looking for mission critical and looking for 24-7 rated, I would steer away from the LED. Well, well, let me add to that real quick. So um, unless they're looking for something more of a solution, not a video wall, but closer down towards the, the console level, because, you know, video walls aren't necessarily for everybody, right? So it may be that they're looking for a console solution um, with a little bit larger but smaller than a video wall monitors at the console, maybe that would be an application for an OLED? Yeah, it, it is a good application in the fact that it can curve to be able to fit the, the actual line, like line of a console itself. The problem is because of its nature, the way it's actually formed, it's very difficult to get it in a very reliable 24 seven panel yet. They do have them, but they burn out very quickly. Um, that technology will develop and will eventually start pushing more into mission critical areas. And yes, you are right, uh, Robert, going on the consoles is where that's going to start first. I think it'd be a number of years before they move to overhead video wall displays. But just in general, when you go OLED, you're not really looking for this type of application in control room. So it, it, it's a possibility and definitely something we're willing to look into. But probably not your first choice for a lot of things. I can think of a lot of better choices. Great, thank you. No problem. Okay, and uh, another question had come in, Robert, while you had uh, been introducing LCDs, asking uh, why not get a less expensive HD TV and use it as a monitor? I, I didn't quite understand your question. Say it again. Uh, why not get a less expensive HD TV and use it as a monitor? I guess over uh, instead of the LCD. So what would the what would the benefits of a LCD be? Well, I think a lot. That there's a lot of answers to that. Um, that's a very generic question. Um, so here here's how I'd answer it: is you, you when so look, monitors come in in HD resolution or 4K resolution. If you wanted, if if your requirements are such that utilizing one or or multiple standalone HD monitors that are 86 inch diagonal, and you want to have three monitors on the wall with some computer inputs hooked up to them, and you just want to display in from that that may be the the right solution for you. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and, but, but that is a vastly different scenario than somebody that, that has multiple users that need to aggregate a lot of information. And then once it's on, on the displays, move it around, resize it, have different kinds of templates that they can organize so that the information on the screen is in a logical uh, format. So both are, are right. There's neither one of them is wrong, right? The, the gentleman or the person that asked that question, it, it might be the right solution to get a standalone monitor that's either 4K or even just HD and a very large one at that. Put that on the wall and do a direct feed right up to it. You know, I, there's nothing wrong with that. I just think it depends on what it is you're trying to accomplish as, uh, as to whether or not that's the right thing to do. Great. Uh, I've also got a question. Uh, how much do the LCD video wall display panels weigh? The display panels, well, depends on the manufacturer. <laughs> they can range from 25 or 6 pounds a piece up to probably 35 or 40 pounds. Not so much 35 and 40 anymore. They're starting to get, you know, thinner, lighter, et cetera. But I would say if you used an average of about 30 pounds, it, you know, that's a, that's a good start. And then, you know, as you get more information about what your requirements are and the need to install this, you can look at manufacturer specifications so that if you're working with facilities, you can get them the exact, you know, weight of each of these monitors. Okay, great. 
And um, what is the pixel pitch that would be required for LED to be a viable option for a control room? Oh, so that, you know, again, a little bit subjective here. Um, if you're showing showing video and video is about all you want to show, then you know you could actually get away with a 1.25, maybe a 1.5 pixel pitch, which is readily available today. And the prices are starting to reduce uh, because smaller, more narrow pixel pitches are being introduced that are less than one millimeter. Um, and but I would say that it, it would have to be, you know, again, if it's fine content, maps, SCADA systems and stuff, I, I think it's got to be down <laughs> half of a millimeter. You know, I mean, it's got to be a, a pretty significant reduction, I think, for me personally to feel like that it, it would be the quality that most people would want. Okay, um, I've had a couple people have to jump off, but are, are thanking you for answering the questions. I'm just trying to get through a couple more of this. Um, I think that's about the end of the questions. I don't see anything additional. Okay. All right. Well, you know, again, I went way over today, but that might be a good thing. You never know. <laughs> So, uh, you know, to those, we've still got quite a few people on the call. So thank you for joining. And like I said, um, we're going to continue to do these uh, in the future with different topics. We may take some of what we've talked about today and in the other series from the summer and, and really drill down uh, and get very granular with some of the topics um, that we have here for those of you that are really interested in learning more or you have applications where in the future you're going to be updating a, um, a control room and needing to learn more about it. So uh, one more time, Lisa, if nothing else has come in, I think we'll call it a day, and, and I'll thank everybody again for joining. Yeah, I don't see any additional questions, but, uh, you know, please, everybody, you've got uh, the email addresses there in front of you, so um, continue the conversation. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, um, Brandon and uh, Jennifer. Thank you, Lisa. No problem. Thank you.